Welcome to the Situation Update for, what is it, Thursday, July 14th, 2022. Mike Adams here. And of course, packed information today. A lot of practical information for you as well. I've got some new announcements, too, that you're going to really enjoy about removing radiation from water. Hmm. That should be interesting. But first, continuing from yesterday, you know how we covered the uh, New York City nuclear public service announcement? Well, since then, a story appeared in the UK Daily Mail, and here it is, quote, pack a bag, know where your medicines are located. Eric Adams, that's Mayor Eric Adams, uh, Eric Adams says PSA telling New Yorkers how to deal with a nuclear bomb was prompted by fears of a Russian attack. So here we go. Adams now admitting that the reason they put that out was because they believe that there could be a nuclear attack from Russia. Well, of course, that's why, you know, given that the U.S. is provoking Russia into a nuclear escalation. But some of the bullet points from this story, I think, are really useful and interesting. Here they are. Uh, New York City's Office of Emergency Management created a video after the Russian attack, Mayor says. Oh, they mean Russia's attack on Ukraine. Okay. Quote, the bizarre timing of the video is raising questions. One official simply saying, we really don't want to put this off. <laughs> okay. Let's see. In May of 2022, a member of Putin's puppet parliament, that's the UK Daily Mail saying that, as if, as if Joe Biden isn't a puppet, right? It's funny. But he says, Putin's puppet parliament bragged on TV that the Russians could wipe out the U.S. with just four missiles. And actually, that's true. That's not bragging. That's just a description of Russia's nuclear capability. Uh, it goes on. It says a nuclear blast in New York City would likely kill 1.2 million people instantly. And Adams said there's no imminent threat, but New Yorkers should prepare for natural disasters, too. Well, I don't think there's a natural disaster that is like your city getting nuked. I don't know what he's talking about. It's like, oh, in case of a nuke, do this and this and this. And... What if it's a natural nuke, I guess, is what he's saying. But there's no such thing. There's not a natural nuclear bomb that can go off over New York City. So once again, Eric Adams joins the oblivious New York government here by not telling people to have iodine, which is just, it's just shocking to me. He says, pack a bag, know where your medicines are located. What does he mean? What does he mean, pack a bag, like have an extra shirt? have some socks, and then know where your medicines are located. What's he talking about? Prescription drugs, antidepressants, heart pressure medication. No mention of iodine. No mention of a bug out bag. No mention of the collapse of the city. And really no mention of what would happen if a large nuclear bomb went off over New York City. So one of our listeners, who's also um, a fan, works with a firearms company in Texas, he sent me a link a while back that I used in a story yesterday. I thought I would share this with you. It's from nuclearsecrecy.com slash nuke map. And then another slash. If you go there, there's nuclearsecrecy.com forward slash nuke map forward slash. Then what you can do is you can choose the area where you, you can simulate a, a nuclear detonation over any city and any size nuke. So you can choose New York from that map, and then you can enter the yield. And if you enter the yield in, well, it's in kilotons, okay? So if you start small, and you can do this with me, or I'll show you the pictures of this, but you can enter a yield of 16 kilotons, okay? One six. And that's about the size of the blast in Hiroshima, I believe. Roughly about 16 kilotons. And then you click detonate. Then it shows you the results of, of that nuke and how many people are killed and how many people are injured and so on. Now, a 16 kiloton blast is not very big. It turns out the atomic bombs that we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, even though they did effectively end World War II with the Japanese Empire and I believe forced the Japanese surrender, uh, those nuclear explosions were not very strong at all compared to what is available today. So as you can see, I'm showing this on the video here, 16 kilotons. The fireball radius is only 240 meters. The fireball doesn't even go beyond really lower Manhattan. 
and it doesn't this doesn't really produce very many you know casualties uh, according to this simulation but if we if we move up to let's say 1 megaton which is 1000 kilotons so type in 1000 in the yield box and click detonate okay now take a look at this image remember this is 1000 kilotons or 1 megaton Oh, let me interrupt myself. I forgot to tell you, you need to choose in the options. You need to choose air burst instead of surface burst. And then you need to click the checkbox for casualties. And then it will estimate the number of casualties. So the 16 kiloton explosion is estimated to kill about 236,000 people in lower Manhattan. And then to cause about 628,000 injuries. All right, now if you go up to 1,000 kilotons or one megaton, Let's take a look at that image. Now, one megaton is actually small for modern nuclear weapons, but just a one megaton explosion, as you can see the fireball, which is the orange circle, the fireball alone extends, it engulfs most of Brooklyn, goes down to Bayonne, let's see, almost to Newark, uh, almost to Queens, okay? And the estimated deaths are 1.7 million dead, and the fireball engulfs all of lower Manhattan Island, by the way, all the way through Harlem and almost to the Bronx, okay? And it estimates 3.16 million injured. So that's one megaton. And again, one megaton is very, very small. Now, if you type in 100,000 kilotons, you're getting a 100 megaton detonation. And this is, you know, Russia's got 100 megaton warheads. That's not their most common warhead, obviously. It's their biggest warhead, but that's what they have. And if a 100 megaton warhead is detonated over New York City, just the fireball alone takes out, what, half of Long Island? It goes all the way to almost to Trenton. And then, let's see, on the west... Uh, well, you can see this image yourself. It covers a lot of area. It goes into the Reddington Township. Up to the north, it goes to Ridgefield, Monroe, Warwick, and so on. And it just engulfs Stamford, Huntington, Islip, all of it. That's the fireball. And the fatalities are estimated at 8 million people with another 6 point, roughly 7 million injured. And that doesn't include fallout. The fallout is on top of that. So in understanding that Russia has 100 megaton warheads, and by the way, the Russia's Poseidon underwater, you know, nuclear submarine drone system, you know, the system that could cause the radioactive tidal waves, those systems can carry reportedly 200 megaton warheads. And information varies, but I've been told up to 300 megatons on, on certain things. But anyway, officially, those are known to carry 100 megatons which is what we're looking at right now in terms of an airburst over New York. Obviously, the effects would be different if it detonated under the ocean. But this just gives you an indication of the enormity of the energy that would be involved. And let me tell you, there would be nothing left of Manhattan, okay? Manhattan Island would be flattened. It would be mostly just rubble and ash. Even the people. It would just be turned to ash. So what is Eric Adams talking about when he says, you know, have a bag, you know, pack a bag, know where your medicines are. And then they have a PSA like shampoo, take off your clothes, wash off, and then, you know, tune in for more media information. They're clueless. They're clueless. I mean, I talked about this yesterday, but I wanted to show you the maps today so you get a sense. And you can go to that website that I mentioned, nuclearsecrecy.com slash nuke map. And you can go in and play around with it. You can play around with different, uh, you know, simulated detonations in different areas like Washington, D.C. or Houston or wherever, wherever you think uh, Russia might strike. And as you can see, you know, most of the population of every nation is just coalesced into a few cities. And those cities are the economic hubs. When you take out New York, what happens to... Wall Street, the stock market, the economy, of buying, selling, trading of commodities and food crops and international shipping and everything. 
you know, New York is a hub of a lot of economic activity. They take out New York, they take out most of America, you know, in terms of logistics and supply chains and so on. And if they hit Los Angeles or they hit Washington, D.C. or all three, it's over. You know, America's in, toast in, in that situation. So the other information lacking from Eric Adams and the New York a public service announcement is how do you like how do you know when water is safe to drink after there's been a nuclear attack and since of course i run a science lab and i've got you know patents on this stuff i've got a patent on cesium eliminator that i mentioned yesterday but i i also have a patent on a, a way to remove heavy metals and from water and food and that patent is called Heavy Metals Defense, and it's in the U.S. Patent Office. You can search for it. You can see it. It's pretty interesting. And what I've done with that research, using the ICPMS instrument in my lab, which is a elemental analysis mass spectrometry instrument. So one of the elements that we test is cesium. And, of course, the radioisotope of cesium, known as cesium-137, is the one that is very, very devastating following both nuclear accidents and also nuclear weapons attacks. And it's cesium-137 with a half-life of 29 years that irradiates, or I should say contaminates the soils and the water and then the cow's milk and the food chain and also the marine ecosystems and so on. Which is why you can't eat shrimp or fish out of that ocean area if it's been, you know, cesium-137 has fallen in that ocean. You can't harvest seafood for a long time. So the question is, and, and what's missing from New York's information is, how do you remove cesium-137 from drinking water? Now, I'm going to tell you how to do it right here. And it's great news. And it's really simple. You're going to love this, actually. So let's take a look at water and radioactivity. Because here, here's an important distinction that you need to understand, is that water itself, which is H2O, Water itself is almost never radioactive. We'll, we'll explain why here in a second. But water can contain contaminants, which are themselves radioactive. So, and that could be cesium-137, for example, or it could be isotopes of uranium or something else that's in the water. And that's causing the water to appear to give off a radiation signal. I mean, if you wave your radiation meter over the water, you're like clickety-click. Yeah, there's radiation in there, but it's not the water. It's not the H2O, folks. It's the contamination in the water. So technically, from a physics point of view, and you can bring this up, you can bring up uh, webelements.com if you want to look at this, but hydrogen, I believe, only has, what, just two isotopes, right? Whereas oxygen has, I think, three stable isotopes. Oxygen 16, which is almost all of it. You know, it's like 99.999% or whatever. There's oxygen 17 and oxygen 18. So that just des describes the masses of the different isotopes that are still oxygen. And yes, technically oxygen 17 and oxygen 18 can be used in some kind of nuclear imaging and, and in radioisotope medical diagnostics and things like that. But uh, in, if, if you have a bunch of water that's perfectly clean, and then there's nuclear fallout, and then suddenly the water is, quote, radioactive, it's not the H2O that's radioactive. Again, it's the stuff that fell into it. Okay? So, I mean, technically you could say that some small portion of water has, you know, oxygen-18 isotopes at 0.02% or whatever it is. You can look that stuff up. Yeah, it's slightly radioactive. Okay, whatever. Well, so are bananas. But I'm talking about major radiation here from fallout from a nuclear blast. And what makes water radioactive is particle contamination that contains radioisotopes. And the good news in that and why that matters and why I'm geeking out on you here is because you can remove that using almost any standard high-quality water filter. You got that? You don't need a special anti-radiation water filter. You just need a water filter that removes particles. That's, no, seriously, if your water filter removes lead, 
And if it removes, I don't know, pesticides, if it removes what, what other uh, mercury, arsenic, almost certainly it's going to remove cesium, which means it's going to remove cesium-137. I've done some tests on this in the lab, but I'm here to announce today we're doing a brand new test. We are going to bring in a, a whole bunch of new water filters. I'm asking the, the big Berkey guy to send me one too. We're going to test that. We're going to test a bunch of other brands. We're going to test camping filters and cheap Walmart filters and everything. And what we're going to do in our lab using our ICPMS instrument, we're going to spike water, this, like the same water. We're going to have like 20 gallons of water, maybe 30 gallons. We're going to spike it with cesium. And then we're going to test that to get a starting point of how much cesium is in the water in parts per billion. And we, it might start out as like, I don't know, 40,000 parts per billion or something. Who knows? Whatever it ends up being. And then we're going to pour some through each of these water filters. And then we're going to take the resulting water and we're going to test that in the ICPMS and see what percentage reduction of cesium has been achieved. And I love these kinds of projects because I, I like to use science to help people get prepared. And again, be, before I learn about, you know, mass spectrometry and the physics of nuclear fallout and all, all of that, especially you get a lot of education writing about Fukushima and Chernobyl and now nuclear war, you, you know, you, you come to learn that radiation in water can be removed just like lead can be removed, just like mercury can be removed. And, you know, I've seen water filters that are specifically marketed to remove radiation. I'm here to tell you, folks, that based on my understanding of the physics, there's no way to remove, quote, radiation from water without removing the, I mean, you have to remove the radioisotopic contamination particles. That's what's being removed. If you remove the particles, then what you get out is just H2O. And H2O itself is not radioactive. Understand? I mean, even, even if you have water that is exposed to radiation, it doesn't make it radioactive. And, you know, I've had a lot of people have been confused about this issue. You know, for example, there's been questions over the years, like we test our spirulina for radiation. And we have done that ever since Fukushima. I don't know if you knew that, but when you buy spirulina from the health ranger store, that spirulina is tested for radiation in addition to everything else, the heavy metals and so on. And the reason we do that is because there was a lot of consumer concern about spirulina being radioactive. But in all the years since Fukushima, now what, 11 years, we have never found high levels of radiation in spirulina. And you might say, well, what's this all about? What's the deal? Well, spirulina is grown in Hawaii. And Hawaii uses Pacific Ocean water. And Fukushima is dumping, you know, radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean over there in Japan. You know, some amount of radiation goes into the water. So you could conceivably say, well, gosh, there, there could be radioactive contamination of the spirulina. Could there not? You know, theoretically, I suppose it's possible. But you don't get radiation if you filter the water because the radioactive particles, first of all, they're very, very heavily diluted in the entire Pacific Ocean. So, you know, the amount of radiation that Japan releases, it is detectable right off of the Fukushima facility. It's not detectable, you know, 100 miles away and certainly not you know, thousands of miles away. But even then, even if it were, when you filter the water coming out of the ocean and you remove, you know, all, all the minerals, because you have to remove the sodium, you have to remove the magnesium, you know, salt water is salt, sodium chloride, and there's a ton of magnesium in there, and a bunch of other trace elements. In order to use that for aquaculture, you have to remove all the elements. And so I think reverse osmosis is the most common way to do that. If you use reverse osmosis, I mean, any RO system that you have, uh, even if you just bought it online for like 200 bucks and you have an RO system in your house, I can almost guarantee you that's going to remove 
all of the radioactive isotopes of common contaminants like cesium. That's going to remove all that from the water, just as it removes, you know, sodium and magnesium and uranium and lead, arsenic and everything else. So, so part of the answer here is that, yes, reverse osmosis can treat radioactive water. Even if it's not specifically certified to do so, mark my words, it, it removes, removes the radioisotopes because it removes everything other than the H2O. And a similar effect will be seen with other water filters that use elements like KDF, as it's called. KDF is a very common you know, water filtration element has a lot of surface area and it absorbs all kinds of heavy metals and things and pesticides and other water filters use, you know, activated carbon, which also is really good at removing a lot of things. Uh, they use like coconut shell material. I, I forgot exactly what it's called. And that's effective too, by the way, it's, it all works. So all these contaminants, whether it's cesium or uranium or lead or anything, they are removed by all these different methods, including water distillation. But what I want to explain to you is that if you, if you take a bunch of radioactive water that's contaminated with cesium and you pour it through a water filter, and then the water that you get out of it is radiation free, which it will be in most cases, unless it's a cheap filter, understand that the filter element will now be a concentrated source of radiation because that's where it was trapped. All right. So in the same way that if you have water contaminated with lead and you pour it through a water filter and you, the resulting water is lead free, well, where did the lead go? Oh, it's, it's in the filter, right? I mean, it only makes sense. I, I, I know you get this. I, I apologize if this seems remedial, but not everybody gets this. They think like water filters destroy the lead. No, they don't. They just concentrate it. They hold on to it. So the lead is still there. Same thing with the radioisotopes such as cesium-137. So you can end up with, if, if you're in New York City and there's a nuke and there's fallout and you're trying to figure out, can I drink this water? Can I not drink this water? What should I do? And if you can get some water and you pour it through water filters, which is a smart thing to do, and then you drink the water, you should understand the water filter element is now probably very radioactive. So for this reason, you're going to need to stock up on more water filters. That's kind of one of the points in all of this, because you might need to change them out more frequently, you see, or like stay away from like, don't put the water filter next to your bed, or, you know, keep your distance from it. In other words, because of the inverse square rule of, you know, radiation exposure. So let's say you're living in a Mad Max fallout scenario and you have this water filter that's working great. You know, a camping filter, catadine filter, big Berkey filter, whatever it is. And you've been using it for 30 days. That sucker is going to be very radioactive. Doesn't mean that it's dangerous to use. It just means it's doing its job. Doing its job. And so I was, you know, I have some really good radiation meters. And I was, I know you can buy like low level radioisotopes that are legal to buy online. I mean, even from Amazon, you can buy like radioactive uranium dust or something. I'm not sure I'm going to do this, but technically I could take that and I could mix it into the water and have like low level radiation water. And then I could run that through the filters and then I could wave the uh, radiation meters over those filters and you would hear like, you know, these filters are radioactive. I'm probably not going to do that because I don't want the feds asking questions like, what are you doing playing with radiation in your mad science lab? And you being a conservative, you must be planning a dirty bomb or something. You know, you can see them freaking out, right? So I'm probably not going to do that. In fact, I'm, I, I can tell you now I'm not going to do that. <laughs> just, I don't want to be accused of building a dirty bomb just because I'm trying to demonstrate how water filters work, you know? But if, if you happen to have some natural radiation source, I mean, this super low level radiation, but it still shows up on your meter. And, you know, there is, there's natural radiation like radon all over the place, but I don't know if you have some low level radiation dust or something, you could do this experiment yourself and you could see that it's filtered out by the water filter. And now your water filter element is radioactive. 
because it's doing its job. So what I'm going to do in my lab, by the way, I'm going to use non-radioactive cesium one, uh, not 137. I think it's 134. No, wait a minute. Which, which isotope of cesium do we have? Oh, wait. Okay. It's 133. Yeah. Just had to look that up. That's the naturally occurring isotope is uh, 100% cesium-133. Uh, I do know that cesium-134 can be produced in a, a nuclear explosion, and that is a, that's a dangerous radioisotope, so I'm glad we don't have that. Uh, we do have cesium-133, uh, which is non-radioactive, and it's used in uh, ICPMS labs all the time. It's part of the standards that we buy from you know, standards providers. Anyway, Cesium-137 is the very dangerous one, and Cesium-134, I think, has a, uh, a shorter half-life and is a lot less common. But anyway, we're using non-radioactive cesium for this experiment, but I'm going to be doing that over the next few weeks. I have to gather up all the water filters. I have to gather up enough cesium standard, and I've got to uh, run. i got to do all the ICPMS runs and everything and then film the results, but I'm going to bring you that. And uh, I really look forward to doing that. So I'm going to show you which, you know, which water filters that you can buy off the shelf actually remove cesium, which means they will remove cesium-137 also, by the way. So good stuff to know. But in a pinch, or if we all get nuked before that video comes out, let me tell you, any good water filter will remove cesium. So, you know, don't get your $20 or, I don't know, $15 <laughs> Walmart special, you know, carbon filter pitcher thing that you put in your fridge and you pour water in it and it just runs right through, doesn't even slow down. That's that's probably not doing a good job. A a good water filter will it'll take some time for the water to go through it, especially if it's a gravity filter. It's going to be slow. It should be slow because you want that water to have more contact time with the filtration media. That means the media is working, it's doing its job and it's removing toxic elements. Good stuff to know. All right, so that'll be coming to you soon. And then on the same issue of preparedness and gear, we've got another discount code for you from Dawson Knives. If you missed out on the American-made uh, awesome knives and swords, you know, you know they're made with the Magna Cut special alloy that resists corrosion. You can get them in CPM 3V or, or Magna Cut. Uh, DawsonKnives.com, discount code that's good for 10% off. Exclusive for our audience here. Use the code July Adams. That's July Adams, all one word. I have it here in all caps, but it might work in lowercase. Who knows? July Adams, 10% off at DawsonKnives.com. And if you go there today, remember Thursdays are the days that they usually put new knives in inventory because they're always sold out. And you can almost never find anything there that you want because everybody's always buying it. Because everybody wants, you know, high quality, you know, like survival knives and, and outdoor knives and self-defense swords or what have you, just tools, right? So today is the day. Every Thursday they have more inventory. And I, I wish you the best in finding the knives that you want. Uh, they are not inexpensive. They're not made in China. They are rugged American made. Just amazing quality. I've done some videos on Dawson knives. I'll probably do some more again in the future kind of show you my my growing collection of knives and swords all from Dawson now because it's my favorite knife and edge weapon company. Anyway, DawsonKnives.com. Check that out. And here's an interesting headline from thefirearmblog.com. Women now make up the largest group of new gun owners. Did you know that? According to a recent study conducted by Harvard University, women now make up 40% of new gun owners, accounting for nearly half of all new gun owners over the past five years. The number is up 14% from five years ago, and 3.5 million women joined the ranks of new gun owners between January 2019 and April 2021. There's also a survey from the National Sports Shooting Foundation. I think that's what it is, the NSSF. Uh, basically, if you're a woman listening to this and you are interested in having a firearm, uh, you are not alone. I think most of our audience here, actually, the, the majority are women and very capable women, by the way, very informed women who understand the need to have a firearm as a, an equalizer, you know, especially given how insane 
uh, a lot of the criminal element is these days, but a, a firearm makes you uh, equal in the ability to exert force and you know stop someone's violence. So uh, check out firearms. If, if you're new to firearms, um, you know, welcome to the club, but get good training. Go out and, and get a good firearm that you can use. And remember that if you don't have the forearm strength to rack the slide on a typical Glock, which is it takes quite a lot of strength to rack that slide, there is an option for you called the 9mm Easy pistol. It's called the M&P Shield Easy, and we're going to show you the website for that. You can get it at smith-wesson.com. It's Smith & Wesson, which is also known as uh, M&P. So this 9mm Easy pistol, it only takes about half the strength to rack the slide compared to a Glock. Very easy to rack. Now, I own one of these. I bought one specifically to try this out because I've got family members that are kind of on the elderly side as well that need to be able to defend themselves and want to train with pistols. And they, uh, they had trouble racking the Glock because uh, it just, you know, it's a very heavy spring. Well, you get this m and Shield Easy, which you can buy from or order from any gun shop, basically. And you've got essentially a Glock, you know, a Glock type firearm with, you only need about half the strength to rack the slide. So, and it's also got a, a grip safety that, that for people who are nervous about, oh, it might actually go off. No, this one has a grip safety that actually works quite well. So I recommend this, especially if, if you're getting in the years and, you know, you, maybe you don't have the forearm strength that you used to have. This is a great option, really great option. The nine millimeter shield easy. And if you're wondering how you're going to afford one, don't worry. You can use the money that I just saved you from not having to buy a special radiation filter for your. <laughs> okay, I'm kind of joking, but maybe I save you some money on that. You don't need to buy a radiation filter for water. You just use a good water filter. And then you take that money you saved, put it into a nine millimeter easy pistol, get some training. And now, not only are you drinking clean water, yeah, you're, you're defending yourself with nine mil rounds. You know, welcome to the party. Now, now you've, you've got a shot at making it through all this. But speaking of getting up there in the years, I've got to tell you about a technology that I've used for the last six years that's called a micro-impact platform technology. The company's called Juvent, J-U-V-E-N-T, juvent.com. And I was introduced to this company when I spoke in Dallas, Texas at the Truth About Cancer conference. I was doing the Elemonics presentation at that time. You might recall that. And I met the inventor and the founder of Juvent. His name is uh, Pete Simonson. And he was telling me about this. He's a mechanical engineer. He was telling me about this platform there. And he, he actually brought one to the event. And he came to my hotel room to set it up to let me try it. And I stepped on this platform and it goes through this frequency cycling thing and it finds this, you can feel it, it's, it's vibrating, but it's vibrating at different frequencies. It goes and, and so on. It cycles through them and it, it, it's checking the feedback of where your body resonates. And it's not woo woo. I mean, it's physics. It's like where you have the best resonation with your skeletal structure and your body mass and you know, your weight and so on. And then it, it fixates on that frequency and it infuses these micro impacts throughout your joints, your skeletal system, your nerves, your skin, your organs, everything. It's like a, it's weird. It's like a full body massage type of effect and it increases circulation everywhere. And if you look at this technology, it's pretty amazing. This, I'm, I'm going to go through it here for a little bit. It's called the Juvent Micro Impact Platform. I've been using it for six years, but Juvent has reached out and they want to be mentioned. They want to be a sponsor of Brighteon. They want to help support, you know, free speech and natural health and healing and recovery and, and all of that. So, so with their permission, I decided to, to share my, my experience and my story. So I've been using it every morning or nearly every morning, except when I travel for six years. So the very first thing that I do when I wake up is I step on this plate. Now, it, it has an automatic on 
uh, sensor. So you step on it and it starts vibrating right away. You don't have to bend down and flip a switch or anything. So it, it starts vibrating. It does. It goes through the frequencies. It finds the right one. And then it starts vibrating. But it's micro impact. So it's not like a whole body vibration thing, which is too aggressive and, and subjects your body to too many Gs and so on. This is micro impact which is what your bones need. It's what your joints need. And there's a whole lot of research behind that of what this does in your body to uh, increase bone density, reduce joint pain, uh, boost circulation, uh, also boost lymphatic circulation. And I I'm telling you, this, this thing, by the time I get off of this, I I'll stand on it for like 15 minutes in the morning while I'm checking news on my mobile phone, <laughs> by the way. I'm looking at headlines like, what crazy thing has happened today? And I'm doing this vibration. By the time I'm done, I am warm. I'm warmed up. And sometimes I'm starting to sweat. And the body, it's, it's almost like I went for a morning jog. But I did it just standing there, you know, checking the news, standing on this vibration plate. So if you will spend 10 minutes a day on this thing, and I, I, I do more than 10 minutes because it's, it's really amazing. And it's so easy. You know, you don't have to get into a hot tub. You don't have to take your clothes off and put them back on and dry off and all that. You just stand on this thing with your bare feet, or you could stand on it with socks, no shoes, but socks or bare feet. You stand on it and it does the work. It, it's really amazing. So I became a strong advocate of Juvent technology and I recommended it privately to lots of people, uh, coworkers and family members and friends and so on. And I've heard a lot of great feedback. The only downside I heard is that, you know, it's expensive because it's engineered in America. It's made in America. It's kind of pricey, but they have financing and so on. You can check it out at juvent.com. And the thing is, it's so much cheaper than not having your joints work, right? And, and not having good bone density and so on. So if you go to juvent.com and find out about this, I think you're going to be amazed. And, and you, can, you can try this. You can learn about how it works and so on. Again, they are a sponsor of Brighteon now, which I think is great because this is a natural health type of approach. This can, even though Juvent can't claim this, but I can say that, you know, if, if you if you boost your bone density naturally, if you boost your joint circulation naturally, you can avoid a lot of bad health problems that might ultimately lead to, you know, a lot of medical visits and surgery and things like that. It's better to use natural approaches. I know you agree with that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening here. So this is something to check out. It's it's mechanical, but micro impact. And one, just if you spend 10 minutes on this thing, you're going to know what I'm talking about because it changes the way you feel. In fact, when I travel, I miss this thing. It makes me very uh, frustrated. Like I was on the road recently and I, I didn't bring this with me. There's just too much stuff to bring, right? Can't bring that. I did bring my blender though. I brought my Vitamix blender, and I brought avocados and bananas, of course. Can't run out of those. And I brought all my turmeric and flax seeds and whey protein. All that. I was making smoothies like Matt, but I was missing the Juvent vibration plate. Well, it's the micro impact platform, technically, is what it's called, because it's not just whole body vibration. It's something very different. But I miss it when I don't get to use it. And if you have anybody in your family that's really getting up there in the years and maybe is having trouble with balance, or who easily falls and maybe even breaks bones, you know, or breaks a hip or something like that. This technology, I believe when combined with silica, you know, dietary silica, if you combine dietary silica with the micro impact platform, the Juvent platform, okay, this is my personal opinion. This is my assessment. You're going to experience rapid bone density repair and bone breakage repair because the kinetic energy of the micro impact platform stimulates the bones to pull in elements from your blood for repair. And if your blood contains orthosilicic acid, which I've done a whole little mini documentary on that, by the way, also known as living silica or just silica, but it's, it's really called orthosilicic acid or OSA. And maybe we'll talk about that more later, but I think if you combine those two, your bones are going to recover and heal 
and you'll heal breaks, you'll improve bone density, and you'll make yourself more resilient against future, you know, accidents or whatever, you know, falls. No matter what your age, bone density, especially among women, you know, because of the hormone changes, they often lose a lot of bone density. And I think the magical combination, in fact, I, I really should do just a whole special report on this. I think the combination of the juvent plate and living silica is just mind-blowingly effective. And by the way, the, the company, the brand that I recommend on the silica, you, you should watch my documentary. It's on my channel. Let me see if I can find the name of that for you here. Uh, here it is, The Silica Miracle. I just posted it a month ago. It's called How to Protect Your Brain from Toxic Metals in Food and, and Chemtrails. So what silica does also is it binds with dietary aluminum and it pulls the aluminum out of your body and thereby protects your brain from suffering the dementia effects of aluminum toxicity, right? So folks, if you're not drinking water with silica in it, like Fiji water has it naturally, that's what makes it taste so amazing, uh, you can supplement silica. And I strongly recommend that you do on a daily basis, even though we don't, we don't offer a silica supplement, by the way. We don't, we don't have anything for sale in that area. But if you're looking for a brand, check out Organo, O-R-G-O-N-O. -O. Organo uh, Living Silica is a brand that I use and that I recommend. And if, again, uh, watch my documentary, The Silica Miracle, and get one of these juvent plates. You combine these things, plus vitamin D, of course. Don't forget your vitamin D, but I, I figure everybody knows that. You combine these things, boom. Man, you're going to have bone density you're going to be, <laughs> your bones will be like someone 20 years younger than you. you know, seriously, you can actually go to your doctor and measure before and after, and you can, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. It's that powerful. People are still amazed even at, at, at my bone density. I, I almost broke my hand like six months ago. I was offloading, actually at the lab, I was offloading this very heavy pallet of an instrument. Um, from the back of my truck onto this, what was it, like a hydraulic lifting table. And uh, I made a mistake. The table got away from me and uh, it crushed my hand between the one of the levers and the, uh, the pallet. And I thought for sure that I had broken something. And I didn't. Nothing was broken. It was bruised, but all the bones held, you know. And I'm in my 50s and that pallet weighed like 400 pounds. I mean, I, I crushed my hand and I walked away from it. And I can only thank, you know, vitamin D and silica and bone density for that. And, and plus, you know, I, I do use my hands on the farm. And so I'm, I'm always giving them, you know, proper stress, which builds bone density and so on. I mean, I am physically active, but, and I've never shared this before, but I was, I was, uh, I was thanking God that day. I was like, thank you, God, that I didn't break my hand. Because that would that would have uh, slowed me down on on everything else. Obviously, this, can you see the headlines? Health Ranger breaks hand in the science lab. Oh gosh, what else could go wrong? No, it didn't happen because because of bone density, folks. Bone density will help you survive car accidents as well, and falls and slips on the ice in the winter and all that kind of stuff. So uh, maybe I should do a whole special report on that. Anyway, you know we may be carrying some kind of silica product at some point in our store. I know we don't have anything right now, but we've, we've got to look at all the brands and assess them and see, see what we think is the best to do the lab tests and everything. We've got to carry something in that category because it's so important for people as, as we all age, you know, silica protects the brain. Silica builds bones. It protects tendons and it also boosts, you know, hair and skin and nails, and uh, people combine it with collagen a lot, you know, for cosmetic effects, and it, it really helps them have, you know, a younger appearance. So there's so many benefits to silica. It's, it's amazing. If you want to get some right now in water, it's called Fiji water. You just go out and buy Fiji water, and that sweet taste that it has is actually the orthosilicic acid. That's, that's why Fiji water tastes so unique, and it's actually very, very healthy. It's, it's, that's why people in Fiji they they don't have very many cavities, by the way. They're, they they have strong teeth 
strong bones. It's one of the reasons they're healthy. If they, if they have that natural water, it's, it's got this mineral in it. One of the few places in the world. Isn't that funny how some wells can, can have very beneficial minerals like uh, silicon, which is the basis of this, or what, like magnesium or, or what have you, whereas other places have toxic wells that's full of cadmium and arsenic, you know? Arsenic contamination is very common in wells. I think it's the most, I think it's really one of the world's largest causes of cancer, by the way, is arsenic contaminated water in developing nations. So geography matters, and depending on where you are, what, what water you drag up out of a hole in the ground could be like the miracle healing water if it has orthosilicic acid, or it could be deadly cancer water if it's full of arsenic. So this is why it's good to have your water tested. All right, let's shift gears here into some economic news. As you know, yesterday, the new CPI numbers were released. That's the consumer price index, 9.1%. Mm-hmm. And that's what's been causing so much havoc in the markets over the last day or so, day and a half, whatever. 40-year high, 9.1%. That's the Department of Labor. It's the highest rate since 1981. And remember that the consumer price index does not cover food and fuel. And I don't think it covers housing either. So the real number of inflation that, that you are well aware of is something much closer to 20% or even more. So we are actually, if you were to calculate inflation the way they did in, in the late 1970s, we would already exceed the inflation of the Jimmy Carter era. Remember that? 18% interest rates and so on. Well, hey, at least the Fed was trying to fight inflation at the time. They just kept raising rates, you know, by hundreds of basis points at a time. Like, boom, hike it up 2%. This month, another 2%, just hike it up there. At some point, people were paying 20% for mortgages and things like that. I mean, crazy times, right? But it brought down inflation. Well, right now we have inflation that's it's a runaway problem. You know, in reality, again, it is closer to 20% right now because the government lies about these numbers. They try to downplay them. If you put in fuel and food and housing and everything else, you know, it's it's a big number. So the Fed is expected to react to this in a very aggressive manner. And that's why I'm bringing this up. The Fed is now expected to raise interest rates by a full 1%, which is 100 basis points in their next meeting, which is coming right up here this month. I don't know the exact date, but it's coming right up. So the 9.1% CPI number has the Fed, well, it has the markets panic, but the Fed is also panicked to try to bring this down. And so it is widely believed right now by financial analysts that they're going to raise rates 100 basis points real soon here. And remember, the last rate raise was 75 basis points. And mortgage rates shot up from there. And the cost to carry a mortgage has you know, skyrocketed. So housing is going to get clobbered even more than what has already begun. And you'll recall, I said in April, right, this is the peak. This is the top of the housing bubble in America. And uh, it looks like that's turned out to be quite accurate because it started falling since then. You've got mortgage lenders that are firing people all over, you know, just laying off staff or just firing them. You've got, uh, let's see, what is this from CNBC reporting that demand for mortgages is shrinking. Mortgage applications to purchase a home fell 4% for the week and we're 18% lower than the same week one year ago. Got that? So 18% reduction on new mortgages compared to a year ago. The average interest rate for a 30-year fixed mortgage with conforming loan balances remained at 5.74%. Okay, Applications to refinance a home loan were 80% lower than the same week one year ago, says CNBC. You got that? 80% lower for refinancing. So to buy a home right now, you're paying almost close to 6%. When the Fed raises rates another 1%, that 6% is going to go to 7 or 8% pretty quickly. The mortgage industry will respond quite rapidly, also based on their expectations of where interest rates are going. 
So remember, the mortgage rates can rise more quickly than Fed rates. They do. So this means that home buyers are going to find themselves out of the market of most of the homes now because the, the real estate bubble has been so big and, and so widespread that a lot of home prices have tripled or quadrupled in the last decade or so. So there really aren't cheap homes for sale anymore. There's really almost no low cost homes. Most of the homes are now very pricey. People won't be able to afford them. So we're going to see a collapse in the in home sales and new home construction. The entire home industry marketplace is going to suffer a massive uh, contraction, a depression, and also, by the way, deflation. So you hear a lot of talk about inflation versus deflation. What's happening? Well, yes, inflation is in food and fuel and a lot of consumer goods, and it was in lumber. But now deflation is kicking in as interest rates go higher, which is causing a contraction in the price of borrowed money. So you're seeing deflation now in things like copper, for example. You're seeing deflation, lower prices, in things like... Um, buying uh, kitchen cabinets, you know, at Home Depot or wherever. You're starting to see sales. You're starting to see prices come down for things that are related to housing. So right now, if you wanted to go out and buy furniture for a house, you're going to start to see some discounts. There's deflation because fewer people are buying new homes. And by the way, if you wait four months, six months, you're going to see sales like you've never seen before going to be blowout liquidation sales of um, home furnishings and tile and carpet and everything that goes into a new home. It's going to be on sale because there aren't that many buyers in the market, especially as interest rates keep going up. So that's something to keep in mind. Remember how I said, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I said you're going to have buying opportunities for vehicles. If you want to use vehicle, you're going to be able to buy it very cheaply coming up maybe in 12 months or less. If you want to buy a home, those home prices are going to come down. Although that that might take, I mean, that might continue to come down for a couple of years, by the way. So I don't know where the bottom is. Impossible to pick the bottom. But if you want to pick up something on the cheap, I mean, I don't know, what whatever. Maybe you need a, a tractor, let's say. Tractors are probably going to get cheaper too. Because now we're starting to deal with the contraction phase. So food is going to continue to go up, but tractors may start to come down. And vehicles and, and homes and things like that. So watch all of this very carefully. And also, by the way, gold and silver may also come down some more just because the dollar is showing a lot of strength versus other currencies. Gold and silver are holding their value versus the euro and other currencies but they're losing value in the dollar because the, everybody in the world is fleeing their currencies and going into the dollar. I explained this the other day. So the dollar is going to be artificially high for quite some time. It's going to make gold look artificially low. But the good thing about gold is it always has its own natural intrinsic value. doesn't matter how it's priced in dollars. What matters is that you have the ounces in your hand and you can always trade those ounces later for things like homes and businesses and land, cars and tractors and firearms and things like that. It's like, hey, I'll trade you this one gold coin for that really awesome AR-15. How about that? Straight up trade. You know, that's about the right price for a really nice AR, you know, about what, $1,800, $1,900, something like that. Now, the other thing to keep in mind here is that we're dealing with a kind of a subprime mortgage collapse in automobile loans. So auto loans that were made over the last two years were made in the same manner that home loans were made in 2005, 2006, 2007. You know, watch the movie The Big Short, one of my favorite movies, that and Idiocracy. And we're coming up on The Big Short 2, or The Big Short for the auto industry, because <laughs> just like in The Big Short movie, you know, what was that scene where that pole dancer was like, I own, you know, what, three condos, or I forgot the exact scene, but... That's when the guy knew, oh my gosh, this is a bubble. This is insane. You know, we need to bet against this market. Well, the same thing is happening in the automobile industry. A lot of auto loans have been made with 
you know, ninja type, remember that no income, no job applications, ninja, N-I-N-J-A. That's what's been happening in the automobile industry. So we're going to have repos of cars and trucks, especially the kind of high end, you know, luxury trucks. Repos are going to start accelerating in a huge way. So there's going to be a lot of banks taking possession of cars and trucks, including, by the way, rigs, you know, like 18 wheelers and such for all the reasons that we've covered previously, a lot of transportation, uh, logistics problems, you know, diesel problems, engine oil, and so on. But you are going to see a glut of high-end used vehicles in the marketplace accelerating through the rest of this year and well into 2023. And vehicle prices are going to come down. So there's another deflation that's going to kick in even as food prices go up car prices are going to come down. And if you've been sitting on assets, you know, whether it's cash or, or gold that, you know, you can do a private sale with gold or what have you, or turn it back into cash and then buy a vehicle with it, you're going to be able to get some very, very good deals because of the kind of subprime collapse of the automobile loan industry. Now, by the way, kind of related to this, there is an air conditioning parts shortage that's being reported in Texas. Um, what is this? NBC, Dallas, Fort Worth website. AC parts shortage continues as summer heats up in North Texas. Uh, Steve Stewart, owner of the Southern Comfort Mechanical Heating and AC specialist in Louisville, has been trying to stay on top of this. He says silicone, which gets used to seal around electrical components, Three weeks ago, there was only eight of these in the Metroplex, so we had to bring in a supply from Atlanta. This week, ball valves are in tight supply, very limited supply. Stewart's team has been dealing with a shortage of parts due to COVID-19 lockdowns in China, bottlenecks at ports throughout the country, and other problems. Many businesses have been trying to stock up on parts since the shortages began last year, but it changes week to week. Apparently, there's a shortage of a refrigerant called 410A or 410A. The other item is R22 for older systems. This has been tight supply. It's getting more expensive by the week. Availability is getting tighter and tighter and so on. So, you know, remember what I said about having backup systems that don't rely on complex technology. You know, wherever you can, have a backup plan in case the parts break down of you know, your electronic components for your HVAC system or whatever you need, your well pump, your combustion engines or what have you, right? Everything's got parts. And the more complex it is, the more vulnerable it is to break down in this global logistics, you know, intertwined economy and supply chain. So living simply is a key advantage in all of this, which is what my whole book is about, you know, resilient prepping, which is free. You can download it, resilientprepping.com. Just download the whole thing. Remember, it gives you high-tech solutions, low-tech solutions, and then no-tech solutions for how to survive everything, the total collapse of civilization. But you need a low-tech option and a no-tech option for every area of survival, you know, shelter, food, emergency, medicine, self-defense, you know, all these things, water. So keep that in mind. This is why I like gravity water filters, you know, because they don't have complex parts. The pump, so to speak, is gravity. Gravity always works, at least on planet Earth. <laughs> if, if, if you can suspend gravity, let me know, because that would be applicable technology to all kinds of things. But without being able to suspend gravity, gravity is going to work. You're going to get your water moved due to gravity, so your, your filter works. Good to know. By the same token, catching rainwater in a barrel, even especially if it's on a hill or something, a little bit elevated position, then you can have gravity flow water from your rain barrel, right? Which is awesome. You can have a little kind of a low-tech shower, a little trickle of water. Maybe you can't call it a full shower, but a trickle. You can bathe in a trickle as long as it just keeps coming. Better than having to wash in a bucket or from a bucket. I don't mean in a bucket. But from a bucket, you know, like a sponge bucket shower, that's no fun. So think about all the ways that you can use, you can harness the power of nature, even solar energy for these 
for solar panels and the solar generators and everything. Think about all the natural ways that you can use the dynamics of nature to keep yourself alive as the supply chain breaks down. And I've mentioned this about homes before, but it's worth repeating. Most homes today are, you know, they're not built to function without air conditioning. They are almost like sealed tombs. And because homes are designed to have this, this eco rating, I forgot what it's called, but you know, efficiency of air conditioning and insulation and so on, they're sealed up and they have no air exchange with the outside air. And so what happens in these homes, they seem great as long as the air conditioning works, but you're actually concentrating all of the internal volatile organic compounds, you know, the VOCs, or chemicals. You're concentrating all that inside because you don't have fresh air coming in. And then when the air conditioning stops because the power grid stops or you can't get parts, these things heat up like ovens. Whereas the old style of building homes, let's say the 1960s and 70s, those homes were built with more natural ventilation. And as I'm fond of saying, if you go to Arizona, you look at places like Tucson and Phoenix and so on, or in fact, much of the American Southwest, and you get the adobe style of construction. And if you wonder why are homes in Mexico built out of adobe? Why do they have tile on the floor? Why do they have this, you know, this layout structure with a lot of airflow through them? Why? Because the Mexicans knew what they were doing. Because adobe homes are cooler than the, you know, traditional two by four wooden stick construction that we have today. Adobe homes are more sustainable. They're cooler. And the tile is cooler also. Whereas in America, we want carpeted floors everywhere. Not, I mean, I don't like carpeted floors, but a lot of people like carpeted floors. You don't have that in hot, dry Mexico, typically. Why? Because it's too hot. And, and I mean, there's a reason they have the clay tiles on the floor, because that works. It makes the whole thing cooler. And I've been in homes in Ecuador, by the way, that were just compacted, polished clay or mud floors. And they were beautiful, by the way. I would gladly live in a clay floor home. Nothing wrong with it. There's some texture to it. There's a little bit of variation in it. You don't need carpet. You don't want carpet. I mean, who wants shag carpet in a hot, sometimes humid climate? Anyway, you want something cool that's in contact with the earth. So a, a, a compacted, polished clay floor, man, that is actually perfect, and it's sustainable. And you might not need air conditioning if you build your house correctly, you see. But that's not the way homes are built today. There's something else just worth mentioning in this of how things have changed over time. I was driving a car recently. It was actually a, a minivan. And the air conditioning was broken in the minivan. And uh, driving through Texas in a broken like an air conditioning broken minivan uh that that right there it's like sitting in a sauna you're getting a sweat sauna treatment in the car for as long as you can stand to drive it all right and uh it didn't have air conditioning because of a there was a mechanical problem whatever it's not like i'm driving some you know redneck junker around or anything no but this car this van did not have air conditioning even though it's a fairly modern van. And as so I was rolling down the windows, you know, and trying to get some air in, I'm thinking, man, how did we used to handle this? Because I remember when I was growing up, we didn't have air conditioning in all the cars. And then I remembered, and maybe you remember this too, but in the cars back in the 1970s, do you recall that there was a little triangle window in front of your regular window on the driver's and the passenger side? You had a triangle in front of your window and you could open that triangle and it would force wind to hit you as you're driving. It was like a little wind funnel. Remember that? You know what I'm talking about? That little triangle there, little piece of glass with a latch and you open that up and boom, you got some what we call 460 air conditioning back in the 1970s. It's four wheels, 60 miles an hour, 460 air conditioning. And that worked. But today the cars don't have that. So there's no way to direct wind onto you 
because they're designed to only work with air conditioning. And you see that and that's the way homes are, like I said. So what we have in modern society is, is we have we've made the more sustainable, low-tech solutions obsolete because every, everything has moved into this dependence on HVAC systems and all the circuit boards and all the supply chains and you know everything has to work perfectly for it to be comfortable and so on. In the 1970s, we just sweated a little more and then we, we opened a little triangle window and we got air in our face. We're like, yeah, we didn't need air conditioning. We didn't have air conditioning. Heck, we were lucky to have seat belts back then, right? And I know uh, most of the listeners to this are well over the age of 30, but if you're listening to this and you're under 30, I have to tell you, you missed out on the fun childhood that we had, those of us who are a generation older than you. We we didn't have helmets on bicycles. We didn't wear seat belts. <laughs> we, 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 parents didn't monitor us. We were free range kids, man. We were everywhere doing every crazy, insane thing possible. And and yeah, we're breaking bones sometimes too. The stuff that we did was so much fun and it was so dangerous by today's standards. And yeah, some of our friends died. Uh, Seriously, you know, I can think of a few myself. You know, we would swing on a tree rope over um, like a lake that was frozen with a thin layer of ice in the middle of the winter and hope we didn't fall and die. Things like that. But at least we were free as kids. And if if you're under the age of 30, you probably did not get to experience the freedom of childhood that, that we grew up with in our generation because we, we were some free-range kids, let me tell you. They didn't even try to control us back then. They wouldn't dare. And we didn't wear seatbelts either, too, you know. You didn't need seat belts because if you're in the back seat, you figure, well, you got cushion behind you and you got cushion in front of you from the back of the front seat. So if you're in a wreck, you're just going to, you know, get smashed into the seat. We didn't wear seat belts. We didn't wear helmets. We did crazy stuff. We would have friends tow us on skateboards with their motorcycles and things like that using a rope. You know, we <laughs> tried to build our own hang gliders and things. Uh, which didn't work, but we tried it all, man. And we're still here. And I got to tell you, I would rather live as a free kid and have a 10% chance of dying than live as these modern enslaved school children with the masks and the, the plexiglass and the social distancing and the forced vaccines and all the mind control and the child grooming and the, the social indoctrination engineering and, and the men can get pregnant and all this garbage, man. To be a kid today is a kind of torture. To be in the school system today is torturous. But when I was growing up, yeah, we, we knew what freedom was. We did a high school fundraiser one time where people paid a dollar to uh, smash a car's windows out with a baseball bat. And um, that was it. You pay a dollar, you get to take a couple of swings at this car and smash it up. Of course, the car was donated. It was a junker anyway, but that would never happen today. They wouldn't let kids smash cars, not as a fundraiser. I mean, I know they do that to police cars in New York City and other Democrat cities. I guess that's kind of a hobby now, but we did it as a fundraiser. <laughs> that was the way we let off steam back then. All right. Good times, right? Mm, good, good memories. Didn't realize how good we had it back then, did we? Yeah, and, and the food was readily available and it was affordable. Gas was cheap. We were paying 40 cents a gallon for gasoline and we were driving everywhere we wanted to drive. It was pretty amazing. And I should say my parents were paying 40 cents a gallon. I wasn't old enough to drive at that time. But that's my podcast for today. I hope you learned some cool stuff today and found this also well, entertaining to some degree. Uh, don't forget that the cardiovascular docu class series, you can only register for about, what, 10 more days or so, healthyheartclass.com. That's coming up, healthyheartclass.com. Register for that. That will definitely benefit you. Don't forget about dawsonknives.com. The discount code, again, is July Adams to save 10% on everything they sell, July Adams. And then don't forget to check out that nuclear map I mentioned. That's nuclearsecrecy.com. Uh, get yourself some some silica or what's called orthosilicic acid. That's good stuff. Uh, check out the Juvent vibration plate. That's at Juvent 
Com. Let's see what else you're already doing vitamin D. Oh yeah. Download my free book resilient prepping. If you haven't already done that, you probably already heard that. And then uh, I'll, I'll bring you the cesium filtration results from my lab. Probably a few weeks later, it's going to take us a little while to gather all that up, but make sure you have a good water filter, just, just a high quality filter. That's very effective at, you know, particle filtration. And that's almost certainly going to filter out, radioisotopes as well. Okay, so that's great news. So thank you for all your support. And if you want to support us directly, just shop at healthrangerstore.com. Can't wait to bring you these water filter test results. I always love that kind of stuff. It's tons of fun to do that. I, I love sharing and teaching information that helps people live well, that helps people survive what's coming too. And just, just be prepared. You know, as Mayor Eric Adams says, uh, Pack a bag and know where your medicines are. <laughs> it's so funny. It's like, don't forget your meds, man. I, I'm like, don't forget your Glock and your, your AR and your night vision <laughs> and, you know, your iodine. But Eric Adams is like, don't forget your antidepressants <laughs> and pack some socks in case there's a nuke. It's like people who aren't into prepping are not going to survive what's coming. That's that's just become very obvious at this point. But anyway, thank you for all your support and all your prayers and all your blessings. Much appreciated. I'll bring you more tomorrow. Until then, be well. God bless you. Take care. A global reset is coming. And that's why I've recorded a new nine-hour audio book. It's called The Global Reset Survival Guide. You can download it for free by subscribing to the naturalnews.com email newsletter, which is also free. I'll describe how the monetary system fails. I also cover emergency medicine and first aid and what to buy to help you avoid infections. So download this guide. It's free. It's my gift to you simply because I want like-minded people to survive.